So I want to say that I feel, I've been doing this for 24 years, and I have spoken a thousand times in 45 countries and national television and whatnot, and I feel uh, partly responsible, partly um, motivated to make sure you guys change your diet before the end of my talk, but that's not what this talk is about. So I'm brought, oh, Stephen stole the DVDs too. <laughs> Stephen walked away with the DVDs. All right, there's some DVDs out there that'll do the job, especially the most recent one called Secret Ingredients that I created with Amy Hart. It's so effective, not only at convincing you to switch to non-GMO, but also organic. Because as you'll see, you don't want to eat just the non-GMO because that's also sprayed with Roundup. All these foods are sprayed with Roundup. So now that I've said that, and I know that all of you are going to watch the film Secret Ingredients at secretingredientsmovie.com or at iTunes or Google Play, then I don't have to feel so much pressure to focus on that information so I can focus on fun stories. I have to say that fun stories in my world are how Monsanto and their minions deceive, threaten, uh, kick people out of positions, how they suppress evidence. And these stories are so important for activism. Because as I approached the subject 24 years ago, who was, who was saying that GMOs were safe? Monsanto and the FDA. So who am I to say that they're not safe? If this big corporation says it's safe, if the government says it's safe, what we need to do is to discredit those who deserve being discredited. But the best way, yes, it's true. <laughs> and as an activist, and communicator, I'm going to say one of the best ways is through stories. Stories are so effective. And in my book, Seeds of Deception, which I released in 2003, it became the world's best-selling book on GMOs, and it stated as, as such for over a decade because it was based on stories. And the first story was of Dr. Arpad Pustai the leading researcher in his field. He had worked at the, at the Rowett Institute in Edinburgh and had published 300 published scientific studies and was their go-to man. He was the money magnet because he was so popular and the top person in his field. He would be getting all these different grants and researches to do. So he was working there and he won out over 27 competitors to get the grant from the UK government to figure out how to test for the safety of GMOs. And working with people in three different institutes and about 30 people, he took the concept of genetic engineering and wrote the protocols. And those protocols were supposed to be used by the European Union to figure out if GMOs were safe. And as part of his research, he took perfectly harmless, genetically engineered potatoes, engineered to produce an insecticide, and he put them through the rat feeding protocol. Now, he knew that this insecticide was safe. It was a lectin, and he was the world's experts in lectin. He started the world's, he started that category of science, and it was the lectin he knew more about than anyone, any other lectin. And he knew it was safe. So when the potato, it's a little bit of feedback here, when the potato was engineered to produce this lectin as an insecticide, he was like, oh, it's so safe. We don't really need to test it. But when they did test it, they found that the rats developed pre potentially precancerous cell growth in the digestive tract, smaller brains, livers and testicles, partial atrophy of the liver, and damaged immune system in just 10 days. You can see the, in the intestinal walls on the, on the right side, the rats that were fed genetically modified potatoes. Now, what was interesting about his research is that he fed one group of rats the genetically engineered potatoes that were producing this insecticide. He fed another group of rats the same natural potatoes and the same balanced diet in addition to the potatoes. 
but he fed a third group of rats natural potatoes, but the, that their meals were spiked with the same amount of the insecticide that the GMO potatoes were producing. So you had GMO, non-GMO, and non-GMO plus a little spray of the insecticide. Only those that ate the genetically modified potato got sick. So it wasn't the insecticide. It was somehow the process of genetic engineering, the generic process. The same process that was being used to create the genetically modified crops being eaten in the UK at the same time. And when I talked to Dr. Arpad Pustai about what was his most shocking moment, and I'll tell you some more shocking moments, but in his, in his story, the most shocking moment came before came right after he discovered all of this, he was asked by his director, Professor Philip James. James walked into his office and put about six or 700 pages down on his desk and said, the Minister of Agriculture needs a scientific opinion on these because he's voting in Brussels about GMOs. And our pod Pustai, the scientist, looked at James and knew that James had these secret, confidential submissions because he was on the 12-member committee to review them. Our pod also told me that he knew James would never read these pages. He was not a working scientist, he was a committee man, as were the other 11 members of his committee. So he realized when he looked at these stacks that probably no one had actually ever read them. And he was supposed to read them to give him a scientific opinion because James hadn't read them and now it was needed by the Minister of Agriculture. So Arpad said, how much time do we have? And James said, two hours, two and a half hours. <laughs> so Arpad and his scientist wife divided him up and they looked at the two things, the design and the results. And he said, reading those studies, Jeffrey, was the most shocking moment in my life. Because I realized what, they were, what we were doing was science. What they were doing was as little as possible to get their foods on the market as quickly as possible. But it was really very poor research. It was bad science. And he described to me all the things that they didn't do that needed to be done. How these foods could be incredibly dangerous. And he spoke to the minister and he said, you know, I wasn't expecting to give a strong opinion after just two and a half hours, but I have to say there's not enough information to allow these foods to be put on the market. The minister said, I don't know why you're saying this. Those foods are already on the market. They've been on the market for two years. This was a shock. They had been feeding the, these genetically modified foods to the population for two years. And then when Arpad got these results from his rats, he realized that the GMOs on the market were created from the same process, but they never checked the immune system. They never weighed the organisms. They never did real biochemical research in terms of the blood. They didn't do his, th these type of slides. In other words, since they were created from the same process, they could be creating the same problems, but no one in the world had ever looked. So these, this same slide could be defining what's happening in the human gut. When he discovered the issues, he was very concerned. And around the same time, he was invited to speak, lost, he was invited to speak on a UK TV show. And with permission from Professor Philip James, the director, he went and was interviewed. They knocked it down to two and a half minutes. And he basically said, that he didn't think it would be good, was a good idea to use the population as guinea pigs. And that he personally would not eat it. And he was the leading scientist in the world in his field. The, the one who was probably the most qualified 
to evaluate the submissions by the biotech industry because he had just spent years figuring out how to evaluate the safety of GMOs. And he said, completely worthless evaluations done by the industry and completely dangerous in terms of the process. He got back to his institute and his professor, Philip James, was like all excited because there was tremendous publicity and this was a way that the Rowett Institute could get some more money and some more research and he diverted all of the phone calls that were supposed to go to Arpad Pustai to his desk so he could talk about how great the research was and he even put out his own press release without even talking to Arpad and it was wrong. But then the next afternoon, two phone calls were placed from the UK Prime Minister's office, forwarded through the receptionist to Professor James. We had heard also that it was Monsanto that called Bill Clinton, and Bill Clinton who called Tony Blair, and Tony Blair's office called Philip James, and the next day Arpod was, was fired. He was silenced with threats of a lawsuit. They withdrew the data. They never implemented his safety protocols. He still had to stick around for his contract. He had nothing to do. He had to sit. No one would sit with him in the dining hall. It was like complete, complete horror. And seven months and one heart attack later, he was invited to speak before parliament. And so he would, they, forced, they were forced to give him his data back. And he spoke before them. His research was published in The Lancet and other publications, and it was the most in-depth animal feeding studies ever conducted on GMOs, and it showed that the generic process of genetic engineering was unsafe. But during the seven months when he was unable to speak, there was a massive effort to discredit him, and they put out incredibly inaccurate lies and disinformation so that people didn't know what to do. So the reality of his discovery never took hold. Because if it had, GMOs would have been eliminated from the food supply on the spot. Now, his sacrifice, his, I've asked him, would you do it again? He said, I'm a scientist. I am empirical scientist. I go with what's a fact. And he also pointed out, he said, you know, after I spoke out, they took GMOs out of Europe. That happened. I opened my book with it. Let's, let's give a hand to Arpad Pustai. <laughs> Amazing man. I opened my book, Seeds of Deception, in the moment that the doorbell rang at his home. He had been unable to speak for seven months. Susan, his wife, answered the door, and there was like 30 reporters, either right in front of them, running from their cars or parking. She said, we can't speak about what would happen. We would be sued. It's okay, the reporter from Channel 4 TV uh, said, waving the paper in front of her. They released your husband. He could speak. He gave her the, the thing. She called for Arpod. Arpod came out. He started reading it. There it was. The gag order was lifted. While he was reading, the 30 reporters slipped behind Susan and sat in the, sat in the living room. And he was able to speak for the first time. And over 700 articles were written about GMO safety within a month in the UK. Within the first week, one editor said, it, does, it divided society into two warring blocks. There were two UK newspapers that were taking a stand against GMOs, one or two for GMOs, back and forth, back and forth. Ten weeks after the gag order, April 27th, after the gag order was lifted, Unilever, Britain's largest food company, publicly announced no more GMOs in Europe. The next day, Nestle's, no more GMOs in Europe. The next week, no more GMOs in Europe. These same companies continued to sell GMOs to the unsuspecting U.S. population because this whole Arpad Pustai affair was described as one of the 10 most underreported events of the year by Project Censored. So information was critical in stopping GMOs. And it was a high-profile headline scandal. And it was a story. 
how he was beaten up, essentially, fired, and ultimately vindicated. So it was the stories that carry the weight. And so the, the book, Seeds of Deception, weaves the health dangers into these stories, which is why it was so effective and why I'm enjoying so much the opportunity to give a full lecture just on stories of deception. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's like the Monsanto playbook. 